Good evening and welcome to Realty Coffee Talk on Awaz Television. My name is Tahir Aik Rashi. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Canada. I'm your host tonight. Topic of tonight is challenges of returning to the workplace. I have three distinguished guests tonight. I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce you to you to them. So I'm going to start with Stephen. Uh, could you please introduce yourself, Stephen? Yes. Good evening to hear. It's uh, my name is Stephen Wall. I'm a general manager with uh, Colliers International. Uh, we manage um, third-party real estate uh, for a variety of different uh, landlords uh, throughout Canada. Uh, my portfolio is um, spread from uh, throughout southern Ontario. Um, we have uh, different types of buildings, including uh, single-store retail, um, Class A office, um, Class B office, industrial, and, uh, and some retail as well. Wonderful. So now I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brett, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, good evening. Uh, Brett Reddick. I'm the president and founder of Red Knights Group. And we're here in Toronto and we're a security and emergency management consulting firm. Uh, we work with a number of different organizations, property management, healthcare, post-secondary education to make sure organizations are prepared and able to deal with a number of different threats like the pandemic we're dealing with now, security issues, whether it's technology. And we provide these services pretty much throughout Ontario and across the other provinces within Canada. Fantastic. Now, Keith, uh, would you please uh, introduce yourself to our audience? Thanks. Uh, Keith Major. I work for a company called Bentall Green Oak. We are a vertically integrated investment management company. We have offices around the globe, including UK, Japan, uh, throughout the United States and Canada. I'm managing partner for our office and industrial practice, so responsible for overall leasing uh, management and development of our office and industrial portfolio across Canada, which is roughly 64 million square feet. Um, and we're spread out Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Ottawa, Toronto, and in Montreal as well. So. Fantastic. Uh, you both, all three of you, welcome. You know, the pandemic uh, has really affected everybody's life, uh, uh, all locked down by the Ontario government and the federal government has put lots of people out of business because they're not able to come and do work. And, uh, and we don't know what the impact is going to be on the, on the economy and how it's going to uh, affect uh, employment and also landlords and tenants uh, who have lost the potential of uh, doing business. We do not know which business or which type of business will survive or we have to rethink about our strategies and goals and way of doing business again to get back as uh, Ontario government is uh, loosening up uh, on uh, lockdown. So the first thing that comes to our mind is that uh, when, uh, uh, how, how, um, how we're going to see the challenges when people are returning to the office uh, workplace. So the first question I will come to you is, See, are how many percentage of people you think in your Stephen experience that your portfolio that you're dealing are really coming back, or they are not coming back? And what are the challenges? Are they making the payments? Uh, landlord is uh, receiving the payment from tenants. Uh, how many buildings you have? They are empty. Uh, we're, we're not sure. So, what kind of planning that you are doing through right now to bring back these people uh, and program that you might be giving? some special concession to these people to come back. You're going to have lots of uh, office building, industry building uh, impacted by this coronavirus. Steven? Absolutely. Um, there, you know, uh, I think the, I think the key um, issue that we're all dealing with in the industry is the uncertainty. Um, and it's difficult to plan for this uh, going forward. Um, you know, we are making contingency plans. We are uh, implementing building uh, and industry best practices to make sure that we uh, are ahead of the curve so that we um, can get, uh, you know, provide comfort to the staff uh, of our various tenants so that they do feel comfortable coming back to the building. Um, there's a lot of different um, 
um, things that we're dealing with, for example, uh, on the cleaning side of um, things, building operations, um, and a lot of those things I'm sure we're going to get into later on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it is quite different for each uh, different type of uh, building. Um, you know, retail has definitely been impacted quite significantly. Um, whereas, uh, you know, there's some retail, for example, that have been doing very well, such as the pharmacies and, and the grocery stores. So it is so building specific um, that we're that that the industry is just um, uh, needing to manage these different types of um, uh, return to work protocols. Yeah, yeah, we're we're going to talk about we're going to pick up uh, one office building. We're going to talk about uh, re- retail plazas or industrial complexes. So that way we are able to narrow down discussion. So before I go uh, to Keith, I need to know about the security situation. What what, what happened after the pandemic? Can you tell us about the security arrangement that you have with the companies uh, before pandemic, and then how it impacted your business? And what are you planning to do about it now? Helping these people to restore the building and, and reoccupy them as the government lift the uh, lockdown. Is that towards me? Yes, yes. Uh, so I think to echo Stephen's points, uh, planning as it relates to reoccupying a building has to look at things both on a grand scale and then a continuation. So yeah. when you try to bring people into a building, what does that really look like? The amount of entrances and exits you have into a building can complicate matters. Uh, you have to deal with the expectations of those tenants and what they're expecting as it relates to returning to work, uh, communicating with those tenants in advance. What we saw when the pandemic hit and uh, buildings were being impacted from a security perspective, security had to sort of shift in how they were gonna deal with incidents as they occurred within a building and find a better way to support, in this case, property management and property owners in the sense of running their buildings to ensure that the buildings were still safe, even if they weren't occupied. Um, I think there's a need when we get further into this, that if the model of how buildings are managed and there are less people in the building, or we're now trying to spend more time corralling people and managing and helping with maintaining physical distance, Security will be challenged more on how do you enforce the rules of the building? Will security be tasked with ensuring that people are maintaining physical distance, as an example? Okay. Keith, uh, would you share something, how it has impacted you? I am going to ask a very special question afterward uh, to all three of you. Uh, It is uh, something uh, related to the safety and security as well. And uh, Keith... Can you tell us how the pandemic has impacted your business, your company, your firm business, how you are coping up with it, what strategy that you are planning to to, to come uh, about to reopening the, the buildings? Yeah, so I, I'll probably start with a couple of different perspectives. You know, one is, first off, I, you know, I think everybody recognizes that we haven't been through this before, so we're kind of making things up as we go and we're learning as we go. Yeah. And we're trying to you know, find the right mix of science alleviating people's fear and anxiety uh, to make people comfortable to be able to come back into the workplace. And, you know, one of the terms in our own firm that we stopped using was return to work because, frankly, we've got most of our people working at home working probably harder than they ever have uh, in the past. So so we now generally say, you know, re-entry or return to the workplace because, it really is not that they're returning to work per se. It's just they changed their location of work. Uh, and there's good reasons why, you know, some of these people are better in the office and some are just fine at home. You know, we've changed a number of protocols. We've thought through, you know, how do people come into our buildings? How do they come into elevators? How many people we should have in elevators? Um, and it, I, th- I would say probably the two big things we really tried to focus in on was, in order to alleviate people's fear and anxiety, we had to have a predictable um, environment that the people are going to step into when they walk into a building in Toronto. So by that, I mean all the major landlords need to have a relatively consistent approach of how we screen people, how do we bring them into the buildings, what to expect once you're in a building, what to expect inside the elevators, what do those protocols look like, because that helps people gain confidence and reduces their anxiety around 
you know, I don't know what's going to happen, or they feel something dramatically different walking through the path from one building to the next. So I think that collaboration effort uh, that happened probably close to three and a half or four weeks ago um, has been incredibly helpful for all the landlords uh, and all the people that are managing buildings downtown just to you know, create a, a, a even benchmark across uh, all of us. So you know, I think on the security side, you know, our approach is there's lots of rules and regulations and controls around us and public health is on a daily basis telling us what we should be doing and not doing. Uh, so our, our personal company approach is let's try and make it a much softer touch. You know, we are planning to have ambassadors in our lobbies that will you know, approach people in a more helpful manner as opposed to oh, stand two, you know, six feet away from the person in front of you. Like we're just trying to help people out. And I think over time, you know, people will get used to it as a change management. You know, they will understand after they've been in a building a couple of times, you know, what the expected behavior and etiquette is. And the more consistent we approach it as an industry, the quicker we can get people to adopt that consistent behavior and that etiquette that we need to have. Because that, ultimately, that's what will give people the comfort to come back into the workplace. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to give you something for food for thought to, to, to have a conversation. We're going to continue. The biggest challenge that I face, because I tell you, my, my son and his wife, they both are doctors and they're in New York uh, in uh, fighting the coronavirus on the front line. And every day we are praying for them, uh, you know, be safe, be safe, be safe. As a parents, what else can you do, right? Now, the, what we have learned through my research on pandemic is a spread of uh, uh, the coronavirus. The biggest challenge we have is a, a, a overcrowding or crowding or keeping the distance is how to prevent uh, spread of the, the virus to to next next person that we're at, uh, closing. Now the other thing is we have an HVAC system throughout the buildings. If you are in a high-rise building in downtown Toronto, 200-story high building with a Thousands of people living there, but there, there are multiple HVAC system and they are circulating air. And if some contamination does take place because of someone, is that somebody has thought about that? Anybody can speak about it. That is something in the plan of contingency plan that how we can control that. You can control entry, people coming in, but somehow... Uh, if somebody gets into a system, is there somebody, is a prevention, something, changing filters, doing some UV filters or something? Is that something planning? Especially I'm going to ask uh, Brett about that. Is that something in your mind uh, or not? Uh, well, those type of things are always on security people's minds, whether there's intentional attack, whether it's pandemic or any other type of uh, airborne um, chemical. So uh, there are a number of buildings that have protocols on how to deal with that and whether, you know, air ventilations or HVAC systems are shut down. Yeah. Uh, there are some technologies that exist that can monitor that on the HVAC system. So from a security perspective, uh, security practitioners think about that quite a bit. And yeah. my experience is most buildings have strategies to deal around, deal with those type of incidents. Uh, Stephen, do you have anything planning in your meeting because you are handling millions of square feet? Are you guys thinking something like that? Absolutely. Um, those are certainly things that we're looking at uh, right now. So I'll give you a few examples to hear. Sure. Um, you know, we, we look at uh, in, in uh, changing the uh, filters to a higher rated uh, filtration system. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at increasing the um, uh, frequency of those filter changes. We're looking at increasing um, air quality testing. Uh, you know, we're looking at UV lights. Um, and I think one of the key things that we're going to be discussing um, is really our partnership with uh, the security industry and the janitorial industry, because, you know, they're really going to be on the front lines um, of this and making sure that our, our, our tenants and our, our, the staff of our tenants are um, feel comfortable being in the office. Um, so those are certainly conversations that we're having um, and we're trying to implement, um, implement these uh, types of improvements. Um, for example, we're also looking at it, you know, you know, I think uh, going in the future, um, elevator dispatching will be a, a key 
um, requirement for, um, you know, class A office buildings, um, you know, touchless doors, um, things like that. That's, uh, those are certainly things that... Um, Innovation will play a role, yeah. That's great. That's great. Oh, Keith, you want to share something on that uh, as a part of uh, your program? Yeah, I guess, you know, a cu couple of perspectives on it. Um, one is we look for guidance from ASHRAE, so American Society for Heating and Refrigeration uh, Association. And, you know, in our view, certainly within the North American context, they are the leading body that, you know, guides us in terms of how we operate our building heating and ventilation systems. And they, they put out very strong guidance around, you know, what role the HVAC systems might play in the potential spread of uh, coronavirus. So we've followed their protocols and, you know, their recommendations were to change the filters to upgrade to MERV 13, which is effectively what most of the hospitals have in them, not in hospital operating rooms. They obviously operate at a much higher level, but, you know, if you look at generally speaking, the hospitals are running the same filtration systems. We had made that commitment many years ago um, where we could. Not all fan systems can handle that kind of pressure. So, you know, every building has its own bit of nuance and uniqueness to it. The one thing that is, you know, an emerging area of research and uh, World Health Organization is part of this research and there's a few others that are working on it is really understanding the role of HVAC and density of space uh, and how those two interact with each other. Because one of the things that we're seeing quite clearly is it's not just about HVAC systems and how the airs get circulated. It's about minimizing the recirculation of air, which we've already implemented. But it's also about how many people you have in that floor at any given time. Mm -hmm. One of the worst outbreaks that happened was in Chicago, and it was in a call center, very densely populated floor. And if you look across that side of the floor where all of those people were sitting, you know, less than one person for every 80 square feet, nearly all of them ended up becoming infected. So. You know, we do understand that there's a clear relationship between density and how, how tightly packed in people are in workspace, as opposed to the interaction with the air conditioning systems. Yeah, fantastic. No, no, this is the concern because uh, right now we're keeping a distance. Even in, in the house, we are sitting and eating uh, in front of each other in the dining table. I have extension in there. I have four of us in the house. We're sitting six feet apart. And somebody, my wife said, okay, I'm going to the dining room. My daughter say, I'm going to go with mom. So they're sitting uh, six, eight feet apart from each other. And we're keeping that because uh, every day we get a call from U.S. says, Dad, are you staying home? And I say, it's been two months that I have not left the house. He said, you're the oldest person in the house. Close to 60, I'm 68. So he said, you cannot leave the house. So I am being served in the house, put it this way. So this is a good thing that you're getting a service, right? Now, let's go back to the... The, what we really need to know is that uh, you can pick, Stephen, maybe you can pick a building you want, a retail or plaza or whatever building, that whichever is where your majority of the business is, whether it's an office building or industrial building, so we can spread between the topics, that how is affecting you? Because are you getting the rental of this property from the tenants if they have signed the lease, long-term lease? Mostly that I have dealt with leases always three year, five year, ten year leases. Okay, uh, if people are losing, uh, they lost the business. They're getting some federal support, but how you are dealing with those complexities uh, financially? Because there's investment involved, not only to acquiring the, the property, but to maintaining the property and also planning for improvement for the future. And you need to forecast some budget for continuous improvement of the building. So there's a money involved. There's going to be a shortfall. And how those tenants are behaving and what are their feedback, the coming back, not coming back, what is the percentage of people are coming back, and what assurance that you are giving them. So you can decide uh, you want to go high-rise building, whichever is yours, then it will go uh, Keith, other different, and then we ask uh, that differently. So pick pick any any any, any building you want. Sure. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, it is so specific uh, for the type of building and the type of tenant. Um, most of our offices and our office tenants, especially the larger um, larger uh, floor plates, um, we've been receiving the rents from on the on the commercial office side of things. Um, same thing with industrial. Uh, most of them have still been able to uh, been, be, stay in business. Um, 
really a lot of the challenge has been um, in our in our retail area, yeah. um, where you know um, some of our smaller retail um, tenants have been mandated to be closed and shut down, um, and and they simply don't have the revenue coming in in order to pay the landlord. Um, the challenge, of course, is from the landlord's perspective is, you know, the old saying, well, you know, when a tenant um, uh, during the good times, you don't uh, come and pay the landlord uh, more rent. Um, but in the bad times, uh, they're asking the landlord to, to contribute. So there's, there's, there's certainly um, those are really the, the challenges that we're fielding uh, with our tenants. Um, and, and a lot of our landlords have um you know, they understand the situation and they understand that uh, it's in everybody's best interest to try and make sure that they have a, a tenant when we come out of this whole um, situation. So uh, I, I think each landlord has their own specific um, uh, requirements uh, for cash flow uh, and each tenant is frankly different as well. Um, and, and and the interesting thing for, for our perspective from in our business is really uh, managing that and keeping the conversation going with with all the parties. That's that's really the function that we bring to the table, where we try and maintain these uh, maintain these discussions and and um, and try and help uh, facilitate um, the needs of those two very divergent um, requirements. Okay, uh, 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 Brett, uh, you want to share some uh, some thought about. Uh, how it is impacted your business security, whatever system that you, you are providing, yeah. how it has impacted you? Are you? Have you lost revenue or you lost any laid off people in your company or uh, are, they, are the federal program, uh, you know, they're giving funding and some mm -hmm. corporations are getting 75% of the uh, paycheck for the employees. What right. What is your company doing and how you think that you're going to come out of this pandemic situation before we go to uh, keep. Yeah. Uh, you know, our major impact is what we saw was, you know, we're typically an organization that goes to client sites and works with those clients directly on their property, uh, whether it be from, you know, doing security assist, uh, assessments or designing security technology approaches. Uh, the shift has now been, well, how can we do that more remotely? Uh, and, for us, what I find interesting is we would, you know, in some cases, projects have been put on hold or pushed back or in some cases canceled. But on the flip side to that, some projects still continued forward, but we had to find different ways to still execute on them. So, for example, we're doing a risk assessment at one particular building, uh, actually out in Vancouver. We have that client feeding us certain information and we're using certain services to be able to garner more information externally about a building. Uh, so we've really learned to try to adapt and use technology on a greater level to be able to do provide our solutions remotely. So uh, I think we've been impacted like everyone else, but I think we'll come out of it okay because we are in the business of trying to make sure that business is sustained. And uh, you know, even even as a small company, we have our own business continuity plan and how we manage emergencies. So um, everything that we've done has really been about making sure that we can rely on someone else's eyes to see things for us because we physically can't get there. Okay, Keith, uh, what is your intake on that? Yeah, you know, I guess a couple of thoughts. You know, generally speaking, the office market was not hit as hard. A lot of them went and did work from home and, you know, continue to, to do their business. In the industrial space, you know, performs a little bit better. The one thing I will say is, you know, set aside retail, which, you know, basically if the doors are closed, they're out of business, so to speak, and they cannot afford to pay rent in any way, shape, or form at the moment. And we'll have to deal with those people separate. Within all the other asset classes, what's really imperative now is actually understand exactly what they do as their business. It's not about necessarily the name of the company or whether their office or their industrial or, or whatever the piece is, you really have to actually understand what their core business is. And, you know, an example of that, we have one of our larger industrial tenants is a restaurant, uh, sorry, as a food provider. And, you know, you would think, well, food provider during coronavirus and pandemic, you know, they carry on as usual. The reality is 90% of their business goes into restaurants. Uh, so, you know, they were suddenly hit very hard because all the restaurants closed down. So, so I would just, you know, encourage people to really 
talk to your tenants and really understand what their core business is. Um, you know, a lot of these people are fundamentally sound. You know, thank goodness we've got companies in Canada that are very well financed. They have strong balance sheets, you know, for the most part, and they will withstand through it. But we need to do our part uh, in helping those. And, you know, certainly the federal government's trying to do their part around various subsidies, whether it's for small businesses or large businesses. Similar to the province of Ontario, they're also providing you know, assistance to people where they need to. Yeah, I, I mentioned in my various program that uh, our economy was moving uh, uh, very, we were rapidly growing and there was tremendous increase in sales in March uh, before uh, 15 March, which was my birthday actually. Mm -hmm. And um, we have this problem came in and uh, all sales went down. Basically, market in the real estate, uh, not party, uh, people have taken out the properties, not enough. Right now, our company is doing some offers on some properties, and we have multiple offers already in, in Milton and in Missoula right now because there's not enough property available. The buyer is still looking for opportunities. The, our industry was impacted because of lockdown and, the, of, and a threat of spread of coronavirus. So it was locked down by the government, by the federal government and military government. Economy was not locked down. It was, it came down, economy came down because of lockdown. Lockdown, all business shut down. People laid off and government has to fork of billions and billions of dollars to make sure there is a money available to the bank. The bank has uh, sold their mortgages to, um, I believe there was a hundred and $50 billion worth of mortgages was taken by the federal government so they can give more money to the to the people available. So it was not because of economy, because of threat of virus. So we're hoping that the moment this lockdown is lifted, we will be rushing back to revive the economy because government is giving lots of money and financial support to everybody uh, uh, to to have income and support their family and, and, and even the banks and loans. And it's amazing support the federal government is giving. So, so it, it, it appears that uh, the, 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 the major impact is probably on the, on the, on the retail plazas and big, big shopping malls. Is that what we're looking at, Stephen? In closed shopping centers, for sure. Closed shopping center. Because we're, they cannot go there. And threat of this, which I mentioned about HVACs, if, if somebody is going there and um, say, I have no, no coronavirus and then it's not been tested, so he spreads the air and air picks up and ventilation circulates everything, you know, and that's the threat. So uh, how, how, we, how are we going to, now, if you are opening your office, uh, we're going to start with Keith. You're opening your office. So what steps you are, did you create a checklist or some protocol defined in partnership with the security company that how are you going to manage inflow of people coming into the office and leaving? Is something that you guys have set up now? Yeah, so, so we have set that up. We rolled out our playbook and uh, executed on training actually last week uh, for all of our property managers across the company. And it really did work as a partnership. Uh, we worked with the janitorial firms that we have in our buildings. We work with the security firms. Uh, we work with the elevator contractors as well. And, you know, built based on research, a, a playbook in terms of how these buildings should function. Every building is a little bit unique uh, yes. and they have their only challenges. So, you know, you can't cover every possible scenario, but you can give people enough guidance and enough reference material that they can work through it fairly quickly without doing all the research on their own. Um, you know, in terms of Benthol Green Oak themselves, because we are, you know, a major employer in Canada as well with, you know, roughly 900 employees, you know, I would say we, we are really quite conscientious about how we're bringing our people back into the office uh, space. And, you know, today we have just a few central service people that are in there, you know, people that are doing deposits and payables and some of those functions that need to carry on, but they really need to be in the office to do them effectively. And we are starting to talk to our employees about, you know, what does it feel like when you come back and how comfortable are you to come back? How comfortable are you to step on TTC um, to come into the office? So, 
So these are conversations that are happening. You know, I would say Collier's is probably in a similar boat. I know we talk regularly to the Life Co's and the major banks in Canada about how they're feeling about it. And I would say unanimously what I hear is everybody wants to take a very slow, very gradual approach to it. They, they don't want to rush in. They just want to, like, get a toe in the water, so to speak, see how it feels, you know, make sure their employees are comfortable with it, um, and then slowly work their way back up. Okay, so we're going to, uh, Brett, uh, what are you uh, suggesting in, in terms of uh, any uh, any partnership that you have recently been approached for your extra activities because you are providing a security and a system where people can use uh, your uh, expertise. Uh, yes. is there, you see more increased activity on your side and also what tools are you using to educate people? Uh, we are seeing somewhat of an increase uh, with the refocus on what we call recovery or resumption of services within buildings. Yeah. Um, and I think to Keith's point, it is really about having uh, open dialogue and collaborative approach to looking at how these buildings run and how people are coming into the building and instilling this level of confidence that when people are in the building, they, they do feel safe. Um, you know, the thing that sort of jumps out for me is if we continue to practice the physical distancing and if this becomes the new norm, um, the way security industry as a whole may have to shift slightly and the way they provide security services to a building. Uh, but it really needs to be collaborative right now. Uh, it's better to walk before you run. Yeah. Make sure you're approaching things more in a strategic way. Uh, the approach should be big picture, not just short term. Yeah. Um, you know, if this is going to be something that ends up lasting for a year or six months, a plan really needs to account for all of that. Um, I don't believe this will be over by the end of the year, in my opinion. I think it will go much longer. Uh, and I think you'll see a paradigm shift within security, both on the physical security, electronic security, and policy and procedural security. I personally feel that this is going to be repeated again because the virus is there, it is uh, muted now, mm -hmm. uh, and as going down and uh, with the, as we approach winter, Potential is that a threat is there that they might it might come back because because of a global economy the accessibility the network we are you know the world has become so small now because of accessibility and I think this was one of the reasons that people who have traveled with this uh, virus is spread so fast around the globe it's affected everybody not just one everybody in the world so uh, Stephen. Uh, so what is your thought on that? I think further to what Keith and Brett were saying, I mean, I think so, I think the industry will evolve. Um, you know, one example, I mean, you know, in, in recently the industry has had, um, you know, uh, a shift to much more, uh, much less square footage per employee uh, with the emergence of hoteling stations and, and uh, work from home and virtual offices. Um, I think uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how the industry does change, uh, because on the one hand, some of the employers might say, you know, this work from home um, might work. Uh, maybe we can start reducing our square footage that we need for offices, for example. On the other hand, you might have some businesses that that do have offices and do want to have employees in there, um, and then social distancing. You know, you don't want to have a hotel you know, another employee in a hotel station, you know, two feet away from you. Um, so there's, it's, it's going to be an interesting a um, uh, few few months uh, at, at a minimum um, as that all evolves. And um, I think with the security industry and, and, you know, what Keith was saying as well, I think it's, it's, it's going to change and uh, we have to just be ready for that. And we just have to have the dialogue open with, uh, with our tenants. Okay, we're going to start, take our break. This is Realty Coffee Talk on Awash Television. We're going to take, uh, uh, take a break and we'll come back to you.
Oh, welcome to Lindy Coffee Talk on Awaz uh, Television. My name is Tahir Aykrashi. I'm your host tonight. We're talking about challenges of returning to the workplace, uh, dealing with uh, office building, retail building, and also industrial units. Because coronavirus has impacted all businesses, and there are lots of properties that are vacant, not currently occupied, but leased. And we have three, my guest panelists specialized in commercial real estate. They are guiding us how they're going to plan to open up these offices, how to deal with the complex issue. We were just having a conversation with Stephen. As you know that uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and uh, there was another company, they were saying they're telling uh, Google, telling their people to stay work from your home until September. So as long as they are paying rent to you guys, there should be no issue. But eventually it's going to become an issue. I do not know if there are any uh, companies who have defaulted on their payment or they've been deferred, how you are dealing with any issue, breach of agreement, or are you helping them to get the federal funding uh, program so help you to pay your mortgage? Are you helping any any way to your people, uh, the landlords? Anybody can speak anything. Sure, um, absolutely. We are working and we're having regular conversations with all of our tenants. Um, at the moment, um, you know, uh, the government announced uh, uh, an assistance program um, and I think that there, a lot of the details are still being worked out. I mean, it's almost minute by minute, day by day, where things are changing. Um, and, and, you know, this morning I received uh, an update from one of the major law firms. And by the afternoon, we received an update uh, on that and, 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 and changed some things. So um, I think the challenge is really, um, you know, keeping the dialogue open uh, with the various tenants um, and, and, uh, Currently, what we're doing uh, with our landlords is um, we're we're doing uh, rent deferral agreements yeah. uh, that we're we're agreeing to revisit the situation in a few uh, months. Um, currently, there's uh, in my experience, at least, there's little discussion about actual rent abatements. Um, although, as we get further into this. Um, um, health emergency, uh, those discussions are coming up more and more. Um, and, and this is really one of the challenges that we're, we're working with our, our landlords on. Um, obviously, the, you know, the building uh, operational expenses, uh, some of them are, have come down as a result of lower occupancy, while, whereas some others, uh, for example, you know, um, janitorial costs or, or security costs or, or some other costs, uh, might have gone up a little bit and, and as, as we're managing with this. Um, so it's a really, it's a building by building uh, basis. Um, you know, the, the property taxes, for example, I mean, the government um, has implemented some uh, deferrals uh, for the property taxes. Um, you know, that helps some landlords on a cash flow basis. But yeah. of course, down the road, those uh, taxes will still need to be paid. Um, and in many of our commercial and in, in most of our commercial leases, um, those operating expenses do need to be recovered from the tenants. Um, so it, it really is a discussion that we have to continue to have with the tenants. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, in our portfolio at the moment, it's, it's really just uh, discussions about a deferral of rent um, as opposed to a bit, an abatement. Yeah, I, I personally feel that uh, it's going to be very strategic planning, emergency. They have to really think about it because deferral is good f- for temporarily, but if the business model is changed and it affects the, the revenue for the company who is uh, renting it, they can have a pile up of loan uh, towards uh, three months, four months, six months down the line because there are still the liabilities and uh, they need to really work uh, plan it properly. And, and and this coronavirus has totally changed. I never thought I would be talking to Stephen and Keith and, and Brett on uh, live TV on uh, Zoom. Did we ever imagine that? Never. So this is an opportunity now. So I take this as a positive opportunity. I have done so much thing 
last two months, you won't believe it. I have my own institute of uh, online learning. I can set up a complete academy online. I have a technology company. And I did that 30 years ago when I came to Canada. And I revamp everything again. So you need to develop a system, online system. Half the price I can do it uh, in a matter of short time. So, you know, we are thinking. We are thinking how we can improve or innovate our ideas of developing new technology or new system, new approaches. Because the old system brought us success to that point on 15 March. After that, everything changed. So, Steve, what are your, uh, Keith, what is your company, uh, Collier? You know, we compete with each other, but we are professionals, right? So, what are you guys are doing it in terms of make sure that you survive this and make sure the business boom, booming and your clientele uh, doesn't get hurt too much? I guess, you know, first off, I'd say Mental Green Oak is a subsidiary of Sun Life Financial. So, you know, from a pure financial perspective, we are very, very well capitalized um, and That's you know, good. very sustainable as a company. If I look more specifically at our own business model in particular, we actually see lots of opportunity right now, and we have a significant amount of capital that we are ready to deploy, and we aren't just looking in Canada or Toronto or Montreal. We're looking around the globe. Um, you know, As I mentioned before, we've got offices in Japan, New York, L.A., London, and we are literally looking around the globe for the right opportunities for us. We've done this before. The last time we had a really good opportunity and we capitalized on was 08 and 09, and we are on the cusp of it again. So we are not shy about taking full advantage of the opportunity uh, that's coming down our way, and, and we think it would be a very strong opportunity to come uh, both in core real estate and also pure value add, um, which is far more optimistic. So you know, we're not shy about it at all. You know, it is a little bit painful, and you know what? Maybe people's bonuses don't quite look like they did last year or the year before, but as a company, you know, we are very strong and we are sustainable. We've not laid anybody off from our company. We made a commitment early on that we wouldn't do that as a result of coronavirus, and we think it's the right thing to do for our company and our stakeholders. Yeah, we, we, have, we are in real estate. We have to be positive. We have to uplift the people morale because... I believe 35, 40% our GDP is based on real estate in, in Canada, I believe approximately, if you could correct me, something like that. And uh, we are a power, we are an economy, uh, our own. Uh, real estate is a very powerful industry and uh, we make the dream come true, residential or commercial. Uh, people make lots of money in, in real estate. So uh, we are highly catered, so I'm, 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 I'm I'm with a panel who are the highly educated uh, professional. And I, Stephen, you also have a CPM and FRI. So good to see you. I hope that you join FRI. I created FRI network on uh, Facebook. So you make sure you join that uh, because I'm promoting a, a FRI designation across Canada. I'm also CIPS myself now. And uh, I really appreciate it. Now we're going to go back to Brett. So Brett, uh, what do you think now we're getting toward the cl closing up, what are the most important things that you think as a real estate uh, brokerage, we have uh, Stephen and, and Keith, or the, the builder owner, our viewer are watching, uh, what steps that you are taking to make sure their investment is safe with our brokerages? So, steps that you are recommending. So we're going to give you a couple of minutes to talk and then we'll go back to our final uh, conversation. I'll speak to it from a general perspective. Yes. Security is really sort of customer centric, you know, security services, whether it's guard services or security systems, they really try to hone in and focus on specific user needs and expectations and try to live up to those expectations. Um, I think from a guard perspective, and I touched on this earlier, the challenge will be is if this continues to go on, physical distancing is one thing, but if I look at it purely from a security perspective, if people are now expected to enter into buildings with masks, right, or some sort of face covering, 
then it makes it security a little bit more challenging. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, you know, you have cameras to help identify things and people. Well, it won't be so effective because everyone's wearing masks now. You know, um, if security has to deal with something uh, to uh, enforce a rule or deal with some sort of, you know, unacceptable behavior by visitors or would be assailant, so to speak, uh, how are they going to do that? Uh, where if you have essentially a two person response, does that become a one person response? Does that guard end up putting themselves at risk of being exposed to a person who has COVID? So the more that the longer this lasts, as I, and I mentioned this before, it will be more of a challenge on enforcing protocols. Um, I'm going to ask you one question because yeah. this coronavirus has to do with the fever also. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's assume somebody has been affected. Okay. So right. it because of fever, it creates some sort of a heat on your forehead because right. you have a fever. Do we have any service? Because when you go to the plaza, there is always sensor on the side. They're looking for somebody stealing or something. Is mm-hmm. there something heat sensor that can say this guy's temperature is a little bit high, so we need to stop that person? Well, uh, there's been a lot of talk about cameras that can as- apparently detect uh, body heat. Um, uh, I think some of those statements are false. Cameras can do that, but it's only on the surface. It's not checking your body temperature. Yeah. You say if you have a fever, right? So these things are more on the surface. There are advanced technologies that are coming out, and I know a number of companies are exploring these. But to answer your question directly, uh, nothing that I'm aware of, and if it is, it's sort of still very, very early on. Uh, but I suspect we might get there a lot sooner now. Uh, because of what we're seeing with the pandemic. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, this uh, a gun that you use for the temperature. I think they're going to eventually put it right in front of the door. When you come in, you look through it. It's going to look at your temperature, and they say, "Okay, come in," or, or it doesn't open the door. Right. Well, I something, think something yeah, I like think, that. You know, even if you get into situations again, if I go back to just a person wearing a simple mask in a building, and if that becomes the new norm. Uh, and we have access control protocols in place for a building. So how people are supposed to get up to a floor after hours, um, well, you can't identify that person. And how do you let that person in? If their card or access credential does not work, then you have no way to verify unless you tell that person to remove the mask and you check or validate their identification. So uh, it'll become a little bit more challenging as this goes on. So basically, in terms of security uh, perspective, uh, the employees and the visitor or, or tenants coming to your building will expect a delay. So they might have to come a little bit early, follow yeah. a queue line. You're going to have to manage, depending right. on downtown, you're going to have a hell of a problem with the thousands of people coming to the one building. Yep. And, and they have to get it six feet apart and they're coming in one by one, going inside. So this is going to be normal for a short period of time, regardless of uplifting of the lockdown, people are going to feel still the fear because it's an unknown phenomena that you have, uh, your killer is in the air, basically. You don't know what to expect, right? So this is going to be norm that we're going to adopt to it, uh, basically, when it access to the, uh, the building. So Keith, I think we're going to start now. We have about 10 minutes to go, so we have five minutes. So I'm going to give you two minutes to talk about the final message that, that you want to uh, share with our uh, viewers. They are builders, they're investors, they are uh, homeowners, they are uh, all type of business engineers, doctors, scientists, they are watching your program. And give us a final two minute message about, and then at the last minute you will talk about your name and number and, and company, please. Closing remarks. Uh, so, you know, closing remarks. I touch on a couple of things. You know, one that we haven't talked about yet is people's mindset need to change around coming to the office or coming to the workplace if you're not well. Yeah. And I think first and foremost, before we talk about you know temperature screening and a lot of those types of things, I think we need a behavioral change. And I know we've certainly been reinforcing that in our company. If you are not feeling well, do not come into the office that day. Period. We're not going to ask. We're not going to you know, screen you or some other way to do it. We expect you to take ownership of that, and we expect you to do that before you leave the house. And I think that's a behavioral change that needs to happen. Uh, I would say you know, 
The second thing is practice good hygiene. There's nothing that will do better for you to get through this than practicing good hygiene and some you know good practices around that. And I, you know, I guess the, the last thing I would say, we'll get through it. It's like, you know, this is not uh, the worst um, of, or the end of all time kind of thing as a, as a society and as an organization and as a real estate industry, you know, we will work our way through it. We've got very bright people that are collaborative and they're willing to work together in all crises. We may all have our own strategy and our own branding, but at the end of the day, we will form as an industry and whether it's part of IRIM or if it's part of, you know, BOMA, we will form those associations and those bridges and we'll come together to collaborate on the better solutions that we can offer. I think, you know, as, a, as an overall message, you know, stay home if you're sick, probably number one on my list. You know, we're going to get through this. It's okay. Like, we don't need to worry about that. And just practice really good hygiene. Wonderful. And now, you want to share your phone number because our studio have number for all our guests. Uh, anyone want to reach them, uh, they can call the studio number and uh, 647 484 0018 and uh, they can uh, contact you. So, Stephen, would you like to share your final message? Um, sure. I, I, I think his uh, point is right. I mean, the industry will evolve. We will all uh, get through this on the other side. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, as a, uh, on a personal level, many people have been impacted by this. Many people have, have passed away. Um, but other others have survived and others have, have, have moved forward. And I think the industry is going to be the same. Um, that's really, you know, that's really the, the message. Um, you know, the industry continues to evolve um, and we just need to be there as well. Um, I mean, who would have thought, uh, it, it, you know, if somebody had told me in January or February that, um, you know, the entire our entire company would essentially be working from home and working remotely and still functioning. Um, I wouldn't have, I, 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 I would have been skeptical. Um, and yet here we are. Um, so I think, uh, I think things do change. And I think, uh, I think the good thing is that, that things can change quicker than we might've expected. Um, and necessity kind of drives that, um, you know, that's really my point. And, uh, um, you know, thank you for, for having me uh, today. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, my viewers. Uh, you have heard our uh, guest panel. They are specialized uh, uh, personalities uh, dealing with the millions of uh, square footage of property management and uh, security uh, in, in Toronto GTA. And uh, this is an opportunity for you to share how they are taking efforts to open up the office building to welcome the tenants and the employees, how cautious they are. They are going to increase health costs to keep the cleaning and hygienic stuff. And they also advise you, if you are sick, don't go to the office because you can infect other people. So this is very, very important. I hope that this conversation was any help to you and give you some guidance. I will take this opportunity on behalf of Awaz Television and Realty Coffee Talk and thank our health specialists, doctors, nurses, police officers who put their life online to protect us and serve fellow Canadians. We thank you. We love you. We also encourage uh, that you take care of your fellow citizen if there are elderly seniors living near you. Please go out and help them and follow your social distance. And if you have hungry people, I know I'm a member of, I'm a director and member of Misaga Real Estate Board. We are raising fund so for the Misaga Food Bank. So if you are in a position to give funds, please help Food Bank. There's a lot of people affected by coronavirus and, and hungry, and we need to help them feed them. This is very, very important. It's our ethic and moral duty as a civic duty as a Canadian citizen to help fellow citizen. So I, on behalf of Wash Television, Realty Coffee Shop, thank you very much, my guests, for coming in. If, if you want to reach any of our guests, please call the studio number 647-484-0018, and you can speak and ask for 
uh, Brad, Stephen, or Key directly, and uh, myself. I thank you very much uh, for watching, uh, and I wish everyone to be remain safe, stay home. God bless you all. God bless Canada. Thank you very much. Bye for now.